taking this thing that um, God has made beautiful and reserved it for a marriage, which is also beautiful, uh, uh, and all these beautiful things that come out of it, and we've actually distorted the image of what that is, you know, uh, through pornography. So Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you, for it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. There are a lot of things to deal with in that passage. Right. <laughs> right? right? Right. I mean, the whole concept of adultery, that adultery goes beyond, sexual sin goes beyond physical adultery. Right. Right. So he says lust, looking with lust, is adultery. So he's blowing open the doors when it comes to the definition of adultery. And the the word in Scripture that's used for sexual sin often is porneia. And that seems to be a, a much larger category that includes sexual perversion of all kinds. All types of sexual immorality. And, and then he ends it with this uh, hyperbolic kind of language, you know, if if you're... Eye causes you to sin, cast it from you. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. And it, it, he doesn't mean to literally do those things, but it's this warning. Are you sure? That, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, is that hyperbolic language? I, I think it is to some degree. I, I think it's serious because what he's saying is that one of these parts will saturate all your parts. You know, that if your eye causes you to sin, it's going to lead other parts of you to sin. You know, until your whole body is engaged in it, and then that will be cast into hell. You know, if your whole body is just devoted to sin. Hmm. Well, I know that passages like that... It doesn't mean to literally poke your eye out. Well, okay. Okay. (laughs) That's one take. I mean, and as you bump up against that passage, that's what everybody asks you about. So does this mean, you know, I got to cut my... Right. you know, appendages off. And, of course, in the history of the church, some have taken that literally. Right. Uh, I think Origen, early church father, took it literally. I think uh, many of the other ascetics yeah. became eunuchs. They made themselves eunuchs because they because of their lust, because they could not control their lust, and that was one way to overcome... Uh, their their control the the bondage that they had to their lust, and so very physical way to deal with that problem. And I mean, it'd be interesting to read some of the reformers on that passage. It'd be interesting to see what Calvin says and Luther. I'm sure Luther has some spicy takes. What would Paul have said? Pornography. The first thing that I think is worth saying that the pornography, I mean, I'm, I'm not even sure we need to define it. Right. I mean, do we really need to define something that every, every man and most young women are tempted by and indulging in? Right. I mean, seriously. Right. It's everywhere. If, if we get into a definition of pornography, I think we're wasting our time. We know what it is. Right. It it is. Um, and the simple definition of pornography does not encompass everything that we can. So when we say pornography, everybody knows what we're talking about. Right. Yeah. Right. We're talking about uh, images that we pull up on our devices, phones, computers, and it's 
used for sexual stimulation. It's used for emotional gratification. It's used uh, to commit adultery in the heart. We do need to talk about its pervasiveness. I can't, I, I think if you're on, you don't even have to be on the computer, okay, right? I mean, uh, a woman runs by you in the park, okay, I, any man or even any woman, right, right can make that into a, a visually stimulating experience right. sexually. M- men especially because we are so visual, yeah, and, and it's a perfect example. Woman running through the park, things are moving. This is not just the sin of men, though. We we have right. to emphasize that now because right. it's becoming much more commonplace for women to uh, it, to give themselves to pornography. I think there are all kinds of stats we could pull up that make that very clear. At the root, and maybe this is getting to the end before we go through what we need to, but the root of pornography is idolatry. Idolatry, not in the way that Tim Keller would define idolatry. Because for for Tim Keller, idolatry is always ideas, hmm. right? It, but idolatry in Scripture is images. Right. Okay, the second commandment is forbidding images hmm. uh, and the worship of images, and we don't think idolatry takes place through images anymore. We think it's ideas. We think it's anything that that draws you away from from a, a biblical worldview or something along those lines. And I'm and I'm not saying that that there is an idolatry in those things. But when you speak of idolatry, the first thing we should be thinking about are the passages in Scripture that, uh, like in Isaiah when the prophet is talking about the man who builds his idol and crafts it and with, you know, worships with it. And then with half of it, he throws it in the fire to stay warm, to keep himself warm. But fundamentally that's an image. And it's strange that we live in a culture where images are everywhere. We're the most image based society in the history of the world. And we don't think we can commit idolatry by by bowing before images. And here's a whole generation who's bowing before images sexually right. and committing sexual sin with images. And so fundamentally, I think we're we're dealing with idolatry here. And the devil is having a heyday with that. Loves to take people off of worshiping God and put them on worshiping idols. I agree. Yeah, we're, we're taking this thing that um, God has made beautiful and reserved it for a marriage, which is also beautiful, uh, uh, and all these beautiful things that come out of it, and we've actually distorted the image of what that is, you know, uh, through pornography. And, and so we've created this false image uh, of what sex is mm-hmm. and bowed down before that and worship that. So it's not only that we're um, bowing down to the image, but we're bowing down to the wrong one. <laughs> we become what we worship, hmm. right? And so that's the danger of idols is you, you it, just as we are created in the image of God, therefore we're to worship the, the one that we get our image from. So idols, which are images... Uh, you know, make us like what we worship. If we give ourselves to idols, we will become like those idols. And so, we're we're giving ourselves to uh, th- pornographic images, right? And w- the technology that we have today is all about images. I mean, just two days ago, Apple came out with that assisted reality headset. And man, it's evil. Oh, yeah. It's evil because it, it, I mean, it's all about not assisted reality, but augmented reality. Right. And so it puts this digital filter before the world and everything real. 
and it keeps the reel there, but it's actually, actually what the headset does is it takes a picture, a video of what you're seeing and projects it on the screen along with the digital interface and all the computing stuff that they add to it. So you're not actually seeing, you're still seeing an image of what's right in front of you. I mean, we go to movie theaters, we pay high dollar to be emotionally moved in movie theaters. We've all got boxes in our homes that project images. Right. We've all got computers. We've all got a cell phone in our pocket, and it's all image-based. Right. Images, 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 and images, images. we actually images. judge films by the images. Oh. You know, how, how, was the, uh, how were the graphics? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and yet we think because it's digital, it's not idolatry. It's not a physical image, right? It's not a, a carved image. It's not a graven image like that. But yes, it's graven. It's just graven with digital tools. Hmm. It's the same thing. It, 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 is, it is man putting his creativity and his time into crafting images. Okay? They just happen to be digital. And so I, I think fundamentally that's the first thing we have to deal with is sort of shock people into thinking that you're just a – if if you have given yourself to pornography, you're just a base idolater. Your sin is no different than those who have bowed down to trees and images of animals. It's a, it's you're committing the same level of sin, so there's nothing new under the sun. And in the end, it all comes to idolatry. It all comes down to idolatry. It all is something that the devil is using to draw us away. <laughs> from God himself. That's important to me. I think we have to I think we have to hit that home. And what are men? You know, uh, what are we? You know, we do have I mean, I know a lot of modern feminists don't like to think of these things in these terms, but men and women have roles and they have throughout all of uh, human history. This is how societies are built upon the roles of men and women and them respectively playing those roles as men and women and as men it's our job to protect women mm -hmm. and we don't do that with pornography i mean we view pornography that's someone's daughter you're watching i mean imagine the horror of a man who's addicted to pornography and turns on the screen and all of a sudden it's his actual daughter in the video he can't scream and cuss and get mad about it he's he's been contributing to it for years so when these young men look up to guys like Andrew Tate, who, who promote all these uh, ideas of getting the, he, he's a pimp. He's got a bunch of girls on OnlyFans or whatever the sites they are, and he's collecting the money from them. That's not a real man. That man is exploiting women. Mm -hmm. You know, he he's not protecting them. So it's just a failure on so many different levels. And I wouldn't, I, I don't like the language, I've been trained not to like the language of speaking of men's and women's roles, because roles are something that we put on and put off, like an actor. Yeah. Let's say responsibilities. Yeah, I, th I think it's responsibilities, but maybe it's just duties that correspond to w what God has made them, How we were designed. from the womb. Right, right. 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 So there's, there's masculine there are duties that correspond to masculinity and duties right. that correspond to femininity and these things are are visible throughout all of human history you know the, the, these are indisputable facts that eggs are expensive sperm is cheap women have always been a protected class and men have always been expendable you know those are the ones we send into war you know, I'm not blind to the contradiction uh, uh, of that to some degree that, that when a man is sent into battle and then he dies and doesn't return to his wife and family, that leaves him in an entirely different type of vulnerable state. But the man gets the man is called to protect the woman. That's right. I mean, that's a fundamental, fundamental duty in Scripture. Yeah. Pornography is a about the opposite of that right i mean short of of murder right. the effects of it i i think we're seeing i think we i think one of the effects of pornography i mean on a micro scale um 
one of the effects of pornography is just um, men being unable to make love to a real woman. But right. multiply that times the, the, the whole society. And pornography suppresses the leadership of men and men doing their work of taking dominion. This is a tool of Satan, but you can imagine, you know, if you're a conspiracy theorist, <laughs> you can imagine the government putting something like this in place to keep uh, peace in society by emasculating the men. And pornography does that. Pornography keeps a man sexually satisfied virtually, and so he doesn't have to go out and slay any dragons. He doesn't have to take any initiative, and he doesn't have to uh, take on responsibility. I mean, it's like it. I mean, we may as well talk about it like it's a drug. It is. Yeah, it is a drug because it becomes that next fix thing. And after a while, this doesn't do it for you anymore. So you go deeper. You know, it's got to go to this level. You know, works the same yeah. way as as drugs. Right. Pornography is not the only sin. Right. I want to de-emphasize it and say that men and women commit other sins than this. Right. right? And so when men come and confess their sins, we often feel like the only sin that makes sense or has enough oomph for us to confess is pornography. And it's not the only sin. There there are sins that go way beyond this. There are sins of the mind. There's pride. There's anger. There are, there are a whole host of other sins that we need to work on and we need to, to pursue our sanctification in. And so pornography is not the only thing. But on the other hand, pornography is so heinous that you want to build up the disgust factor for it, that this is so terrible. There is nothing, there is nothing else in your life where you're promoting such wickedness on this scale. Idolatry, but also sexual trafficking and disease and um, just uh, absolute degrading cruelty that's part of us coming to terms with uh, what we're involved in and i think that's part of repentance from habitual use of pornography it's a part of repentance and a guard is to really up the disgust factor i think we would be surprised by the amount of people that are viewing porn it's not a question of who's viewing it, who's not of course, I experience anger every time I get behind the wheel of a car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty frequent. You know, I get immediate, immediate regret from that. So I'm imagining that's what happens a lot with pornography as well. But, I mean, even fearfulness. Uh, let's start talking about anxiety. <laughs> I mean, there are sins that are, you know, sin is ubiquitous. Right. right. And we all, we all sin against God in countless ways. We are a proud people. Again, you know, one of the things that I think about also as a pastor is the times I've had to do premarital counseling. And inevitably this topic comes up. And one of the things that I tell couples who are getting married is, I mean, there's usually a full session that we do on sex. And in preparation for that, I exhort the couple to confess their sins to one another, their sexual sins. And the the purpose of that is so that they don't find out after they're married if there's any show-stopping sins. Right. They need to be confessed beforehand and dealt with or not dealt with. I mean, it it could end the engagement. And that's fine. I mean, that's that's potentially one of the purposes of it. And then, you know, assuming they get past the confession of the sin to one another and forgive one another and work through that whole process, then that knowledge becomes important for the marriage as they protect one another sexually. Right? So 
often in these situations, the man, I mean, almost unfailingly, the man will, will say, yeah, I've, I've looked at pornography or I regularly do that. And I feel terrible, terrible about it. And the, the woman will be somewhat shocked, you know, and, and then I feel like as a pastor, I have to say, look, so-and-so, you're marrying a sinner. Yeah, he's looked at pornography. Uh, you're marrying a sinner. You're going to find out that he sins in a, in a lot of other ways. And he's going to find out, too, that you sin in a whole bunch of ways that you haven't disclosed before you got married. Right? He knows some of your sins. Right. But he doesn't know all of them. And when you, when you start living together, you're... You'll figure them out. You, you'll find them. But you're marrying a sinner. And and so you, you begin with that. But I don't want to say that and sort of give that, you know, give the man an excuse to continue his behavior. He's got, he's got to stop it. And he's got to realize that his sin, that sin now is a sin against his wife and a sin against his children a sin against his household. It's destabilizing. It's it's dangerous. It's destructive, right? And he and he's got to fight it, and he's got to put it to death. He's got to begin that work very seriously. It's amazing. I was thinking about that the other day, just how. Oh, what was I thinking about? I was thinking about if my son bought a car, he'd have to figure out what he does with the title. He'd have to figure out how to get license plates. And when when I was 16, that was hard to do because you had to ask somebody who had done it. There wasn't like a resource you could go to on your phone and pull up, okay, how do I do this? There was no DMV website. And so... Knowledge is just changing because of that, right? Right. The gatekeepers of knowledge now are at your fingertips rather than you don't go to your parents or your pastor. <sighs> you, you Google it. I think that's hugely important in all of this. Mm-hmm. There are things we don't have to remember. There are things we don't have to convey because we can just do a search online and pull that information up. And we can get to that information a lot quicker and and we can uh, we can learn things a lot quicker. And so, I mean, how how does this come into play when it comes to uh, pornography? I I think I think unless we remove our kids entirely from society and move to a cornfield in Nebraska that is not connected to the internet or the you know telephone lines or or anything, right. um, we have to give them strategies. First of all, we have to define what's evil and that evil is defiling and they should flee far from it. And positively, we have to show them the beauty of marriage, fidelity, sex within marriage, right. all those things positively. But we also have to help them self-govern if they're going to have a connection to the internet if they're going to have phones and obviously i think we should resist giving our children those as long as we can and i don't know what that means i don't even want to be specific on that Uh, and perhaps i'm dealing with a guilty conscience when it comes to my my own sons and daughters on that front you know you give them a cell phone because you when they start driving you want them to be safe you if want they to, get in trouble you want them to be able to instantly give a call yeah. and yet yeah my daughter called me yesterday just to ask the simple question what kind of oil does my car take let me google that for you <laughs> yeah it's and and but along with giving them that phone for safety comes all these other things. And, and I mean, this has been true even before the age of digital images and the internet. 
we have to we have to teach young men how to govern themselves self control we have to teach ourselves self control we have to teach ourselves the fear of the lord we have to work to have a very soft conscience a tender conscience so that when we give ourselves to e- evil we're quick to repent or we flee from it entirely in the first place right, right? and so so we can't rely on I mean, it's obvious. We can't rely on putting safety valves in place like internet search filters and whatnot. We should do that. Right. Those We should make it hard. That is some indication about the fact that we think there's danger out there, and that does teach our children. Right. But in the end, if they're not going to self-govern, if they're not going to fear the Lord, they're going to go after these things. Right. There, there's the, you, you, you can't keep them away from it. And if you homeschool your kids and you keep them out of society and you've, you've put every protection in place, it doesn't matter. They're still going to find it. Right. And if you haven't told them and trained them and helped them as a father to a son govern themselves, psh, and the foundations have to be there. That's what catechisms are all about, right? Is the foundations, you know, what what women are, what men are, what are their purpose, you know, wh- who is God, you know, why are we here, um, what is it about humans that have value, you know, and what are those values, and, you know, because women and men have different values, so what are those values, how do we protect women as men? What does that mean? What does that involve? Well, like I said, that's the hope that my daughter could have easily Googled that information. I'm glad she didn't. I'm glad she called me, you know. And the first question I asked when she asked me that, I said, do you know where the oil goes? (laughs) Do you know how to put oil in your car? You know. (laughs) Yeah. Because I don't remember showing you that. But it used to be that we had to ask everything. Oh, yeah, yeah. We had to have things demonstrated to us by those who loved us, who right. knew us, right? Yeah. We had to know people. We had to yeah. we had to live in the real world. Now we don't ask anybody for advice. We don't have a father come up to us and tell us how to change a tire because we can just in three seconds pull up a YouTube video and learn it better than our father ever could have taught it to us. Right. Or, or we and don't. he wouldn't have yelled at us and gotten impatient. <laughs> I mean, YouTube doesn't yell at you and get impatient. Right. <laughs> That's because they can't see us. <laughs> they can't. So let's bring this back around to the issue that we're talking about in pornography. Mm-hmm. We learn not by real-life examples in front of us. We learn through YouTube. Mm-hmm. And pornography teaches... And so young men and women are learning sex by the internet, and that's a frightening thing. They're, f- they're learning not from the awkward conversations with mom and dad or their pastor or, you know, or waiting till they're an age where they can handle the conversation very young they're learning from deviance and the reality is they haven't been learning from their parents for a long time you know the public school system introduced uh, sex education into school when i was young you know when i was in junior high school it was almost 40 years ago you know and, and so you had people other than parents talking to your kids about sex starting back then what at what grade did you take sex education? Seventh grade, I think it was. Was it seventh grade? I'm yeah. trying to remember. I mean, I went through the public schools. And and sex education wasn't really an education about sex. It was more or less a uh, uh, just a bunch of photographs of people of people's genitalia suffering from this disease or that disease. This is how you identify this or that. It was like a public health course, and not right. not so much uh, a tutorial. <laughs>
Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. It's interesting to me that in the midst of that, in the midst of this, the list of sexual sins, now it goes beyond sexual sins, right, right to, to stealing and drunkenness. But in the midst of the list of sexual sins, it has idolaters, right? Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate homosexuals. Right. And so idolatry is set in the midst of that. And I think it ties in with what we said before. It, 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 image worship is idolatry in the sense that it's certainly spiritual adultery with God. But it's it's also sexual sin. It's porneia. It it, it is the use of image for self gratification, and so hmm. I, I find it interesting that idolaters is in the middle of that list. the The other one that stands out in this list is effeminate, and the the NASB uses the right word there. The Greek that underlies it is malakoi. It means soft ones. I think when it comes to the discussion of pornography, that word should be used more often. A man who's gratifying himself by watching other people is an effeminate. Right? And the man certainly who lives in his parents' basement till he's 35 looks at pornography, withdraws from the world, and thinks that that he's being productive, that is the very definition of effeminate because men are to go out and create. Right. They're he's to take of, dominion, right? right? They're to cultivate and keep the garden. Right. And that lifestyle that, that hin- really hinges on the use of pornography right. is effeminate. It's effeminacy. Right. We're kingdom builders. That's what we're supposed to be, right? Creators, protectors, but the effeminate reject all responsibility. Right? Masculinity, I think we could almost define as uh, the taking up of responsibility. And the times when we haven't, when you and I haven't, uh, we've been we've not been men. Right. Right. We've been not living as God would have us live as men. Right. I've not been a man a lot. And so scripture exhorts us uh, to act like men, yeah. to be strong. A life of bondaged pornography is an indication that you have shunned responsibility, right? You're satisfied with images when you could be loving a woman in all of its complexity, right. creating children by God's grace, and all of that is rejected by the the man who's bound up in pornography and its effeminacy. And people hate that word. The English Standard Version took that word out. And what they do at that point where it says nor effeminate nor homosexuals is they put those who practice homosexuality. They translate it with a phrase right. that has... No relationship to the Greek that's actually there. And I think it's because they were scandalized, unfortunately, by the word effeminate. But it is the right word. Um, they, they suck the guts out of malakoi, soft ones, and basically give the impression that all this is condemning is the passive and active partner in homosexual sex. Right. It's way beyond that. It's a world beyond that. 
This is condemning the dude who's in his parents' basement at 35, taking on no responsibility, looking at pornography. That man won't inherit the kingdom of God. Oh, he's been emasculated, most certainly. Unless he's washed, unless he's cleansed, unless he's sanctified by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you are sanctified by the Lord Jesus Christ, you realize you want you want to follow his will, right? And then you begin to take on responsibility. And it's wonderful to see when men do that. It's wonderful when men leave behind their self-gratification and self-centered effeminacy and start taking on little responsibilities. And that can start from taking out the trash at church every Sunday. But that can grow into finding a woman and getting married and having children and being an elder in the church and caring for other people's souls and being productive and creating a company that employs people so that they can make a living and support their own family. I'm just all kinds of responsibility. And that's masculinity. Man, every once in a while you got to have a big Mac. You do? Yeah. It's the king of all burgers. It's not bad. I don't bad. care what anybody says. It's not bad. I mean, and you grew up with In N Out. That's right. So. I love In N Out. In N Out's the best burger in the world, as far as I'm concerned. But, but every the, once in a while, you got to have a big Mac. That's right. You got to have a big Mac. <laughs> <laughs>